What I really love is that in solving the problem, Will Ferrell says, if the construction worker could talk to Lord Business, what would he say? Welcome to Popcorn Parenting, a podcast about movies, mythology and the Messiah, or in the case of today's movie, postmodernism purity and the power of play how about that that's nice i'm joined as ever by nate morgan Locke. hello to you nate hello james and my name is james carey i probably should have mentioned that earlier i normally do but it's all a bit upside down this time because this is actually take two of the lego movie podcast we recorded one for series two and we binned it we did why did we bin it nate I don't know. It was, it was, oh, it was difficult. It was stroppy. It was petulant. I found myself inarticulate and and bumbling. Okay. And that was, yeah. I just it, was, it, was a, it was a postmodern mess, um, wasn't it? <laughs> and in a way, of all the movies uh, that we were, you know, that we should stumble over, the Lego movie seems like about the right one, isn't it? Because we kind of took it apart and we didn't really know what we had. Mm. But um, we're pretty sure we know what we're doing this time. So let's <laughs> jump in uh, to, the, to the cold hard facts. And uh, before we get to Inner World, the cold hard facts of the Lego movie. We're talking about the original one, which spawned, of course, Lego Movie 2 and the Lego Batman movies and, and other things. It was written by uh, Phil Lord and uh, Christopher Miller and from 2014, starring Chris Pratt, Will Ferrell, Elizabeth Banks, uh, among the voices of other, Will Arnett, of course, as Batman, um, Alison Brie as Unikitty, terrifying. Um, Anthony Daniels, the original C-3PO, is also C-3PO, um, and various others as well. Morgan Freeman pops up at one point, Jonah Hill, and it was a, a sensational hit. Its budget was 60 to 65 million, and it took at the box office $468.1 million. They got their money back with a chunk of change, and they made another one. That's the cold hard facts. Nate, why don't you start us off by talking about the first of those three things of postmodernism, purity and the power of play. Give us an inner world. All right. In a world, an ordinary Lego construction worker, thought to be prophesied as the special, is recruited to join a quest to stop an evil tyrant from gluing the Lego universe into eternal stasis. Wow. Emmett Brokowski is a super basic um, construction worker and he's recruited by the master builders, including Wildstyle and Petruvius, to find the piece of resistance and put it onto the craggle so that they can take down the evil Lord business um, and his plans for eternal domination. So as a story, I think it's it's got a really solid pattern thinking about the chosen one thinking about the hero who's going to rise up and and you know uh, destroy this tyranny but what's really interesting about it is that it's so postmodern that every single thing it says about this kind of standard traditional story structure is mega ironic and right. super sarcastic. And so everything's got this sort of slightly strange, almost cynical feel to it. When you explain the plot like that, it's mm. sort of, it's the underdog versus the big bad guy. Mm. That kind of works and that gives you a lot to hold on to. And also at the centre of it, Emmett, played by Chris Pratt, he's he's not deconstructed in a way. He's completely innocent, isn't he? Yeah, um, at the heart of it and it's like everything and now everything else is up for grabs yeah i mean we'll get on to the innocence thing like Emmett as a character and how he functions within it and the way that his innocence works to um to solve the problem but it's interesting that the all the lego movies have this level of irony and sarcasm 
and at some level cynicism which i think some parents might feel a bit sort of um upset with their kids watching something that's sort of constantly undermining itself yes I think you can feel it as a bit of a threat. It reminds me, and I can't quite believe I'm doing this, of The Name of the Rose. Uh, so the Umberto Eco <laughs> book and movie, yeah, um, which is essentially a medieval whodunit. But at the heart of it is a, um, is a monk who is trying to stop people from reading the, um, an Aristotle book about comedy. So... Uh, the, com- the stuff that Aristotle wrote on comedy famously uh, hasn't survived. Okay. Um, so, uh, but it, it, he, it imagines that it has survived and it's in this, uh, in this very, very labyrinthine uh, library. And this monk basically doesn't want anyone ever to find it or take it out because the moment you start to laugh, the moment you start to understand comedy, everything starts to fall apart in his mind and people will start to laugh at God. Okay. In, in a way, it's like the toothpaste is out of the tube. You can't get mm, it back mm. in again. And so it feels like once you start deconstructing stuff, you deconstruct, you deconstruct, and you're left with kind of nothing, aren't you? Yeah. And it's one of the things that comes up in, in the film, and <laughs> the, the levels of irony, the le- levels of kind of meta storytelling that they're going through are massive. And mm. so when Emmett joins Wildstyle and Petruvius and the Master Builders, um, he goes off to Cloud Cuckoo Land to meet um, Princess Unikitty, who's played by Alison Brie. And Emmett is kind of baffled by how kind of strange and, and weird and technical everything is in, um, in Cloud Cuckoo Land. And he says, how does anyone know what not to do? <laughs> and I just think that's a great question. But she says, oh, here at Cloud Cuckoo Land, there are no rules, no government, no bedtimes, no frowny faces, no negativity whatsoever. And Wildstyle says, oh, you've just said no like a thousand times. <laughs> and then Unikitty says, and also no consistency. <laughs> and you just think that is a level of kind of bulletproofing against yep. criticism because you're sort of leading with the charge that none of this really makes sense. It's all kind of meaningless. It's all a bit nihilistic. But hey, you know, put on a happy face and we'll smile about it. So so it's got this strange kind of meta level that it's working on. But I think as you look through the actual story itself, it can't help but be kind of rooted in at least some level of sincerity. So mm. it, it fails to stay on the surface because it, 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 if it stayed on the surface, it wouldn't be a compelling narrative. It wouldn't have a sense of, of completeness in the storytelling. And that's, yeah. I think, is a challenge with no expert in postmodernism, but it, it's denial of, of meta-narratives, right? There's no real truth. There's Each of us has got our own little version of it, which works for us. And as long as we don't borrow down too deeply, we won't become suicidal and reject everything because we'll realise how superfluous everything is. So, But, but in, in the arc of the story, that, that works out because, as you mentioned earlier on, because Emmett is mm. so innocent as we talked about. So before we move on to that um, second uh, thing about innocence, I think the postmodernism ultimately, it never quite delivers because you, you can't deliver something that is truly postmodern because something has to have a structure. By which I mean, you don't take half a billion dollars at the box office with a truly postmodern film. Because mm. it's unwa- and a truly postmodern film is unwatchable mm. and therefore you do have to have a spine to it. But I guess what's refreshing about the way they do do it is, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but the postmodern nature of it is really interestingly consistent with Lego, which you can continually take apart, put back yeah, together, yeah, take yeah. apart, put yeah, back yeah. together. I mean, you really can do anything that you want and you can make something, you know, my kids make different things from what I used to make. I used to make model villages, model towns, model space stations. I used to make vehicles and buildings. 
and it never occurred to me to do anything else. My daughter, oldest daughter, would use it to make food. She would make mm. Lego burgers and Lego things like that. And my other daughter would, you know, make stuff more like that, that I would make. Um, and you just think, what an extraordinary thing to do. And my oldest daughter, who used to make sort of Lego food, she now makes crochet food stuff. She sort of like crochets burgers and crochets. <laughs> Is she, are you sure she's not just hungry? <laughs> are you yeah. feeding her properly? Fruit and vegetables. No, it's, 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 Dad, it's, I've been trying to show you through yeah. every single toy. I need something yeah. to eat. So in a way, I mean, that is kind of a postmodern thing, isn't it? It's food that's made out of wool. I mean, that's yeah, kind yeah, of... Yeah. So there's something pleasing and delightful about that. So postmodernism definitely has its pluses. And it feels like when you or I were kind of students, Christians were slightly obsessed with postmodernism mm. and everyone gave talks about The Matrix and there was a whole big thing about it. And it feels like we've made our peace with postmodernism because ultimately you can't have a postmodern film because that's an art house movie. Art yes. house movies are often postmodern and they don't have a satisfying ending. They are just sort of a bag of bits. But also it's just to say that a little bit of structure and a little bit of innocence yeah. goes quite a long way, doesn't it? Yeah. And and the fact that they're poking fun at the structure, it's postmodernism in, in the sense that it's death by a thousand paper cuts kind of thing. Maybe a thousand paper cuts wouldn't kill you, but... Um, it would certainly be irritating, wouldn't it? Mm. Um, so you've just got Petruvius, Morgan Freeman, who's prophesying about the special. And then at the very point at which he's finished saying that, at the beginning of the movie, Will Ferrell's character, Lord Business, comes in and says, what a bunch of hippy-dippy baloney. And then the movie kind of all, all sort of kicks off. And you think, okay, so so the integrity of this chosen one structure is suspicious right or it's under attack or it's at risk of falling apart at any point during the movie right the whole structure of the film as you say follows that pattern that he does change people's lives and he changes the course of the universe in lego terms by his sort of fulfilling a very traditional heroic pattern which we will talk about in a bit but um the movie is still trying to undermine that because Petruvius later on says, hey, look, the only thing you need to be special is to believe that you are. And maybe that sounds like it's a cat poster, but it's true. And you think, right, I mean, it is from a cat poster in the film <laughs> because there's a cat poster in the room where they're playing with Lego. And... So you've got this strange kind of undermining that we are seeking the chosen one who has been prophesied, who will restore the peace to resistance onto the craggle. So it's all there, but it, it's it's laced with this, if you just believe in yourself as the special one, then you become the special one. And you think, but no, that doesn't work structurally because that's not the nature of the story and not the nature of, of the universe the the fact is Emmett has no idea what the special one means and doesn't think he's the special one and that's exactly the reason why he's the special one which is so remarkable yeah I mean it feels like we're about to get into the Incredibles which we've not done an episode on but we probably should which yes, is you know in a world a where one. everyone's special then no one's special yeah um but yeah I think Chris Emmett's uh, sorry, Chris Emmett. Chris Pratt, um, Emmett, uh, is really engaging as that kind of central believer mm. uh, character, isn't he? Even though, again, he he is he manages to deconstruct himself occasionally because there's a bit where, and we quote this occasionally in our house, where he sees a, he sees himself on videotape or something, and then laughs and goes, <laughs> "Classic me." <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. So he does get a certain amount of self awareness, but yeah. you totally believe that he would that his yeah. character would say that. Um, yeah. But yeah, he, but that's what's so engaging about it is the central character to me, at least, is a believer, isn't he? Yes, and he and he well, he's a he's a believer in one sense. He he he's quite naive mm. and and sort of accepts what he's told and you know, as as Wildstyle interrogates him about whether he's the special or not, 
you know, she's asking, what's your favorite restaurant? It's like, any chain restaurant, <laughs> you know what I mean? What's your favorite song? You know, everything is awesome. It's like, this is the the worst, right? If you're a cynic, if you're both yeah. like really obsessed with authenticity and, um, and deconstructing everything, someone who just innocently accepts the things that they're told is like the enemy, right? You're trying to get rid of these people or at least enlighten them to the fact that they're totally, um, totally deluded. Um, but his, his innocence is such a powerful tool in disarming so much of what's going on. Um, and, and I think that is such a, a, a key part of the gospel, is is the innocence or the or the purity of Jesus is what means that we can't really deal with him we we we're confused by the fact that he's so pure hmm. and loving and good and i think there's a bit in plato's republic where he talks about what would happen if it sort of there was a truly righteous person well of course he'd get killed because we couldn't stand him and mm. you're like, oh, that's an interesting, you know, possible um, correlations with the gospel of Jesus there. So Emmett as a, as the naive or, and naive is a tricky word, isn't it? Because it, it's sort of, it's something we associate with neg- uh, negative things. Yeah, with, with being credulous. Yeah. Um, his innocence is his, his virtue. Yeah, but in a way he is, he does, have, there is an awakening of sorts, isn't there? It's not just... He he does realize that there there is there is more to life than he thought there was. He was he starts. Yeah. I mean, considering where he starts the movie, yeah. as team player goes to work construction, everything is awesome. And where he ends the movie, he mm. is a, he is a different person slightly, isn't he? With but is the same kind of character. And I think his enlightenment or what he discovers is is not what other people are necessarily trying to teach him. Mm. So you have a gang of master builders, all of whom are holding tightly to their plan to take down Lord Business. And they're all committed to the ingenuity of their own schemes and their power. And yet the way in which they're all saved is by something so foolish as a double-decker couch. You know, that in the film is sort of constantly referred to as like, that is the dumbest idea of all time. And yet it's through the foolishness of the double-decker couch mm. that the master builder kind of gang is able to escape Lord Business. Um, I was just thinking this morning, um, I was listening to a talk about That Hideous Strength, which is the third of three uh, C.S. Lewis novels, which people erroneously call science fiction novels or the sci-fi trilogy. The third book is set in a university town and the proper baddies are going about their business and they basically just don't take seriously the threat from this ragtag bunch of underdogs at St Anne's. And so at a key moment, somebody isn't followed when they probably should be followed by the baddies because they're just underestimated and it's another example of how the underdog the simple the foolish uh, apparently the insignificant overcome you know which is a pretty common theme in movies to some extent but it's really front and center in this one isn't it even though there was an absolute ton of stuff going on and it is br- it's a breathless movie yeah um, and after watching it you sort of think i probably need to watch that again knowing how it ends but that the innocence and the double decker couch is like the the foolishness of the cross to some extent, isn't it? Yeah, and you know when Paul the apostle writes to the Corinthian church, he's sort of talking about how you know the gospel is foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews, but it, God is pleased that through the foolishness of what was preached that he might save both Jews and Gentiles. So in a way, the arrogance or the, pr- the pride, the self-confidence of, of the world and of, of sinners like us is undermined by God in his 
self-sacrifice in the foolishness of the cross. So we preach Christ crucified um, and something that looks on Good Friday like a complete defeat, even to, you know, Jesus' disciples at the time, even to, in a sense, when Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is a, there is a sense in which this is the point of defeat. And yet, because of Christ's righteousness, because of his innocence, because of his purity mm. and his obedience, it is therefore the salvation of all those who believe. So Emmett Brokowski as a kind of Jesus figure in the, the mm. Lego movie, you know, lots of differences, obviously, but he he exemplifies Jesus's innocence and Jesus's purity. And that's an unusual one because normally you get the the substitutionary sacrifice. I'm thinking of um, Hercules diving into the underworld and then, you know, his nobility gives him the immortality and all that kind of stuff. And this is not a normal way of portraying Jesus. Yeah. Uh, un unwittingly, obviously, then uh, yeah. they have zero interest in doing it. But we, we know that yeah. these archetypes and these stories are all Christ-centred in some way or another. You get other examples of it with, like, so Paddington Bear is an interesting kind of character because he's sort of this innocent outsider who comes into this world and people sort of find themselves strangely attracted to him and yet exposed by him. There's a there's a light that he brings that, that reveals things. I mean, you brought up Umberto Eco, so I'm going to mention Dostoevsky. Um, Please do. The, <laughs> Is it Prince Mishkin in The Idiot, who in... You're on uh, your own here. Oh, okay. Well, I think he he exposes kind of the, the manipulative world and the kind of power struggles of um, high Russian society through his innocence, through his humility, through asking very open questions. He kind of exposes all this kind of wickedness that's that's going on and i think that's something that for us as christians and particularly uh, on this podcast we're thinking about christian parents you want to help your child to see the power of innocence the power of knowing that we don't need to be scheming and we don't need to plot everything we don't need yeah. to be totally strategic all the time but that there is something about the way that God's set up the world that means that the humble will be, will be raised. And does that take us on to the power of play? This is more to do with the relationship behind the construction worker and the businessman. So the Lego movie is really about a father and son. So the father's played by uh, Will Ferrell and there is a son named Finn. And he's playing with his dad's Lego and he's, he's sort of putting his own Lego into it. And so the basic idea is that Will Ferrell, as the dad, is Lord Business and he builds his Lego and he follows the rules exactly or follows the instructions precisely and then is so concerned to preserve the structure and the 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 appropriate lines that have drawn on this world that he's going to spray the whole thing with crazy glue the craggle to preserve it and keep it locked down forever and so finn as his son has this whole kind of movie that he comes up with, or this whole story that he comes up with about a construction worker and things, which is being played out by him in the world that his dad has built. And so, in one sense, this is kind of meta popcorn parenting because there's us watching the movie with our kids about a father and son who are also having a, a conversation about a construction worker and a businessman. It's postmodern, Nate. It's postmodern. Well, there's levels to this, man. There's so there's, many levels. It's inception. And the thing that I absolutely love about this movie, or a particular moment in this movie, is that when Will Ferrell, as dad, 
discovers that his son has broken apart various Lego buildings that he's made down in the basement. And he realises that his son is struggling with the rules. But you don't touch things and this is everything, this is how the world's supposed to be. His, his father's being controlling. And yeah. his son is being sort of squashed by this kind of domineering parenting. And what I really love is that in solving the problem, Will Ferrell says, if the construction wor worker could talk to Lord Business, what would he say? So he uses play as a kind of way to tackle this kind of tricky topic. There you go, to tackling tricky topics. He tackles the issue that he has with father-son with the Lego figures. And I think that taps into a lot of what I think we're trying to do with Popcorn Parenting, which is to say, let's think about these stories, let's think about these films as ways to engage the world and ways to engage our children and ways to engage our relationships. And... I think this is really powerful that 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 story and and fiction and literature and and play can become such a powerful way into dealing with the issues that we face. Play therapy is an interesting idea to me. So the I that the counsellors would use toys or, or, or dolls or, or something to help children overcome sort of trauma or, or talk about difficult things. Um, I remember doing, I used to do children's camps, eight to 11 year olds. We used to take kids from inner city London and from Eastern um, in Bristol. And we take them for a week to Treguinis, which is, it's so deep into Pembrokeshire, it's past St. David's, right? So right. West, oh, wow. okay. West, West, West Wales, it's right? It's practically Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Halfway to America. Um, but the uh, we used to take them onto this, this farm, and these were some kids from, you know, in some cases, some pretty kind of difficult backgrounds. We had lots of other kids as well, but I found that the some of the best conversations we had with those children was when we take the box with the puppets from the evening ends activities right. and we put all the puppets out on the table and you just sit there with with a bunch of kids and just let them play with it and weird i think it's something about a puppet which is almost more powerful than just like a doll or a, a figure because your 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 hand goes up into it and you start to personify you, you start to speak for it and you start to act it out yeah and i i wonder whether as parents as christian parents there are ways in which we can allow our children to to play in such a way that they they're able to talk about things with us yeah um and to recognize when that happens You've got the world of Emmett Brokowski and Wildstyle and, and Petruvius. And then outside of that world is this father-son relationship. And the there's a problem with the father-son relationship, which is resolved inside the world of Lego. Now, in actual fact, above and beyond and behind and beneath the earth and the cosmos is a father-son relationship. So, but it's not got, it's not characterized by a problem. It's actually characterized by an eternal perfect love. But the world that we're in, the world of, of you and me, is a world in which that father, son, and, and spirit has chosen to declare the love and the glory and the, and the, the unity that they have through the world that they live in. So just as an interesting idea, maybe questions we'd be asking our kids about. If this world of Lego is a sort of play box for 
Will Farrell as dad and, and his son Finn. What does it mean if this world that we live in is the the kind of play box for Father God and the Eternal Son and the Holy Spirit? What what does that mean for the way that we think about reality? And of course, you know, Petruvius and, and other characters will talk about the man upstairs, you know, within mm. within the Lego movie. So there's there's a lot of kind of religious language that's being discussed. But that may be an, a way in, an entry point for us to think about our, with our, our kids. Um, what if everything that we see exists for the glory of God and was made through Christ for the glory of Christ? <laughs> what if that's behind everything? Yeah. Um, and how would that change the way that we think about a lot of the things that we see in here yeah certainly worth having that conversation after you've said what's your favorite bit <laughs> why did you like it um those sorts of things but it's really yeah. interesting i think you, you know i know that we set out to make series three a little bit different in the sense of we've really hit the parenting bit of the popcorn parenting hard and it just feels like the, the films we've looked at so far really do examine our relationships with our kids yeah. so you know early on maybe we're looking at movies just going here here's a movie you can watch with your kids and here's to how here's how to have a spiritual conversation with them about it afterwards and that's all good and if if you're tuning in and you want that then go back to the first season and you'll get plenty of that but it feels like these movies we're watching now are really asking questions of us and our relationship with our kids how to parent how we feel about it and that idea of play to having conversations with my kids who are almost too old for a bit of that to some extent that they're, they're, you know they're not they're not playing with lego so much anymore stop playing because you get old you get old because you stop playing boom there it is okay very good that's very the good. Line. isn't it isn't it isn't that the reason you have kids so that you get to play with your old lego again i think um, it's partly the reason yeah it's as good a reason as any <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said unbiblically but no, there's lots there to think about. Um, again, it's taken unexpected turns, but I think we've managed to land this somewhere uh, in a in a constructive place. And we're all we're all kids of parents. And you know, I was chatting to my sister, who's nearly ten years older than me, about my about our parents the other day, and it was still stuff from when we were kids is still really deep rooted and mm. often slightly painful and. So, you know, the way in which we relate to our parents, I think it never goes away. And I think these mm. movies open up a whole load of discussion for your parents as well as your kids if you have them. And if you don't, you might. And you might have nieces and nephews. And mm. um, so hopefully there's something for everyone, Nate. That's what we're hoping to provide. Something for everyone. That's popcorn parenting. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Nate, for being with us as always. Yes, thank you, James. Good to chat. And we'll speak to you next time. Cheerio. Okay, bye.